Reverend Stanley. God bless you, Reverend Stanley, because thank you for um holding it down. I'm going to tell everybody, just so y'all don't think Reverend Stanley just be praying long, I asked him to pray a little longer, and he was kind enough to let me get situated here. So thank you, Reverend Stanley, for praying just a little while longer. We're glad to be here tonight on this expectation moment. I'm glad to be here. Let me just take a moment to uh, commend Reverend Stanley. Thank you, Reverend Stanley, for, for teaching so um, di di diligently on Sunday, Monday, and Tuesday. So I'm glad to be on here for this my my um, my role in this relay race as we continue to teach the word of the Lord. Uh, tonight, as we have been teaching, and I have been teaching the last few weeks, we're talking again about joy. We're talking about joy. Um, tonight, we're going to talk about our journey joy in our journey or our journey with joy, however you want to phrase it. Um, we've talked about a number of things that are indicators of what's necessary in order for us to experience the joy of the Lord in our lives. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah, uh, David the psalmist, other psalmists have all declared uh, that in the presence of the Lord is joy. That's, that's one thing that I think is universal. Joy is in the presence of the Lord. The second thing I think is important for us to understand is that in order for us to experience the presence of the Lord, it requires us to have a posture or position in which we are focused or fixated on God. Uh, Jeremiah put it like this. He said, Lord, when I found your word, I ate it. And out of that came joy. Uh, 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 David said a similar thing in regards to his joy, that it was a, con a connection between. Can y'all hear me? Yes. Okay. There was a connection between um god's word and experiencing joy tonight we're going to talk about something just a little bit deeper than that because we're talking about joy for our journey uh, one of the things that all of us understand is this christian life is a journey it's not a wind sprint it's a journey um i understand it better when i talked to paul and paul was very clear uh when he talked about the race he said you know he, he, he in his own testimony as he prepared uh to die he said um I've run, I fought a good fight. I've run a good race. He's, he had a course. But here's a key element for the Christian. All of us have a different course to run. Some of our courses are shorter, some are longer, some are steeper, some are flatter, some go through trying times, some don't have as many trying times, but all of us have a course, a race to run. And so, but the, the, the theme of the theme of joy uh, is a theme that is not based upon our journey, but our journey of the joy in our lives comes from our relationship with God. So I want us to understand that. So we can look at our neighbor on either side of us and say, hey, you know, we got a different race, but we ought to all have joy. And that's what I want to say tonight. Each of us in Christ should experience the joy of the Lord. Uh, in the fourth chapter of Philippians, Paul said a few times, he said it twice, he said rejoice in the Lord. Then he came back and said again, I say rejoice. We as Christians, and Paul demonstrated that, Paul was in jail when he said that 24 times in the book of Philippians, Paul said rejoice because joy was not based upon outside. It was based upon what was on the inside. Tonight in the book of Hebrews chapter 12, that's where we are tonight, Hebrews 12. Um, we're in Hebrews 12. Um, um, we are going to talk for a few minutes about joy for our journey. Um, if you remember correctly, the verse verse of chapter 12 says, therefore, and I've said this on many occasions. Whenever you say there, see therefore in the New Testament, especially, it is referring to what has come before that. And so what the author of Hebrews is referring to when he says therefore is about all the things that were outlined in verse 11. If you remember uh, verse chapter, sorry, chapter 11. If you remember the chapter 11 was about faith. You remember how it started. Now faith is confidence in what we hope for and assurance by what we do not see. This is what the ancients were commended for. And then he says, by faith, we understand that the universe is formed at God's command. So it was seen, so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. He then goes on and names 18 different people who were examples of faith. That's what he says. 18 different people who were examples of faith. 18 different people who had lived by faith and trusted in God. That's what he did. He, he outlined them, and I won't go through them, and if you get a chance, read it again. He, but he, every time it says, by faith, by faith Abraham, by faith Isaac, by faith Jacob, by faith Joseph, by faith Moses. He continues to say that over and over again, um, talking about the, the impact of faith on our lives. Now, in verse, chap verse chapter 12, verse 1, he says this, therefore, in light of the fact that we have are surrounded by so or such a great cloud of witnesses, and I like this, he named 18 people, but there were many more he didn't name. There was a cloud of witnesses. In Greek, the word cloud meant just a large gathering. So imagine 
he said there's a large um um a large gathering of people um a, a stadium full of folk go to mercedes Benz stadium and and see how many people um um how many people what could fit in there that was how many people could say i have faith in god but in chapter 12 he said therefore since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses he said let us do something i love the, the way the author said this let us he said we've seen examples if, let me, can i talk turkey Many of us have seen examples of faithful living in our families. We've seen mama, grandmama, great-grandmama, uncles, fathers, sisters, brothers, and we've seen demonstrations of people who are faithful and who live by faith. So we have, in addition to those people that outlined by the author of Hebrews, there are others that we can look on and say, yeah, they were cloud, they are in a cloud of witnesses declaring uh, that faith is the way to live for the Lord, and, and, and faith causes us to please God. Now, he says, let us throw off everything. There's an action to understand. When you understand something, there's a need to take action. Here's the action. He said, each of us as Christians should throw off everything that hinders us. In other words, get ready to run. Next week, I think it is, the Olympics will start. And whenever you see a race, you'll see whether it's 100, 200, the, the 400, the mile, the hurdles, whatever somebody's running, the marathon, you're going to see people warming up. And then you're going to see them take off something to get streamlined so they can run the race. Uh, the author of Hebrews tells us to let us put aside everything that hinders us and let us put aside the sin so that so easily entangles us. And then he said, and let us run. Let us run. I'm asking us, let us run. Let us run the race. Let us not be spectators. Because, see, the thing is, while we can testify about faith in order to be in that cloud of witnesses, you have to have run the race. One of my favorite things to do, Reverend Sanders, when I'm looking at of sports is I like to look at a game and see all the Hall of Famers and all the old timers who played the game sitting on the sideline looking at the game, you know, cheering it on, saying, I know what it takes to win. For us as Christians, we've seen demonstrations of what it takes to win, but we have to run the race ourselves so that we can then be examples or a part of the great cloud of witnesses. So the first thing I'm going to do is let us, let us throw aside everything, hinders it, sin, in, sin it so easily entangles us, and then let us run. Let us run. Let us get engaged in the running of our Christian race. This is about us individually now. Normally, I talk about two things, uh, individual and a collective body of believers. But tonight, I want to talk about just us individually, because if we all run our race, we'll see the impact on the collective. He said, let us run our race. How should we run it? He said, with perseverance, that a race run with perseverance is the only race to run. A race run with perseverance is a race that is not easily forgotten. It's not easily quit on. A run, race is run with perseverance means that we understand automatically there'll be ups and downs, but we also know that we're going to keep on running during those ups and downs. We know intuitively that in, when we're running our race, we're going to have to press through some difficult times. But the race that is run, and, and, and perseverance is something that doesn't come in the middle of the race. It has to happen in your mind before the race. Because if anybody ever done something difficult, if you didn't make up your mind to do it, how many of us have ever quit something because we didn't make up our mind to finish? We just said, well, we'll see how I play out. I've done that myself. Well, we'll see what happens. God wants us to not be some see what happened Christians. He wants us to be have some Christians that have a made up mind. Perseverance requires a made up mind. Let us run with perseverance the race that is marked out for us. Again, the author of Hebrews agrees with Paul. There's a race that each of us has. Let us run that race with perseverance. Now, verse two is where I want to stop. I want to kind of slow it down here, downship. Here's the next part about running our race. Verse two says, we should fix our eyes on Jesus, fixing our eyes on Jesus. Five words, but these five words are transformative. These five words allow us to understand that we have the best example ever in our Savior Jesus, who died for our sins as an example of how to run a race. Somebody said, well, I don't know how to do it. You know, I didn't, I didn't have nobody in my family. Sometimes people say this, well, I didn't have nobody. I don't know how to do this. We have Jesus. And, and really, we ought to have a close relationship with Jesus, if I could be honest, with than anybody else. He says, fix our eyes on Jesus. Y'all know what that means. When you say you fix your eyes on somebody, that means you're not taking your eyes off of them for nothing. That you've got your eyes on them. You are focused on them. You are, you are fixated on them. You are committed to them. As we commit ourselves fully to Jesus, that would allow us to be able to carry this out in our Christian walks. If I could pass them about 35, 40 seconds right here. One of the biggest challenges to the body of Christ is that people... Uh, say I'm looking at Jesus, but they're looking at somebody else. 
or they look at themselves in the mirror. If we want to have a real transformative relationship with God and have a transformative individual um, relationship with God, it is imperative that we keep our eyes on Jesus. I'm going to say this. Don't look at Pastor Thomas because Pastor Thomas is wrestling stuff just like y'all. I'm going to speak on behalf of my big cousin. Don't focus on Reverend Stanley because we got we to gotta deal with some stuff. Focus on Jesus. He said, fix your eyes on Jesus. Why? Here's why he says it. First of all, Jesus is the pioneer and perfecter of faith. That is two things that can nobody complain to me. Somebody can say, well, I'm the first faith person in my family, but but I didn't I didn't perfect it. I didn't start it. I just I just had faith in God. Jesus started faith. How do you Hey. Oh. Let go. They call me church. Oh, on the cross. And I do he did. He did that. He is the author by faith. If you took Jesus out of this equation, guess what you couldn't say? You couldn't say uh, Romans 10 11, that if you confess in your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus died for you, God raised the dead, you shall be saved. If you take Jesus out of there, it doesn't have any impact. If you take Jesus out of there, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, if you take Jesus out of there, there's no only begotten son. So Jesus is the author of our faith, but he's also in the pioneer but he's also the perfecter. In Jesus, our faith is made complete. As our faith should not be in a church or a book, our faith should be in Jesus. When our faith is in Jesus, we're going to do God's work. When our faith is in Jesus, we're going to live for the Lord. And so he tells us, fix our eyes on Jesus. Let me pause again and back it up and come back at it again. It is imperative that we as Christians keep our eyes on Jesus. Fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfected by our faith. Now, this is why I came, I came all the way over to this church to do this last part. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. In other words, the author is saying that the motivation that, he, that caused Jesus to do what he did for us. Now remember, Jesus didn't die for himself because he was perfect, but he died for our sins. Somebody said, why did Jesus do it? He died because he for our sins. He laid aside his life for our sins. He suffered and endured the, the misery and embarrassment and shame of the cross. Why did he do it? Because he saw something. There was joy before him. Let me pause and tell y'all a quick funny story. When me and Isaiah know when they were little, we would watch football. And you know how sometimes when you were watching the game, the, the quarterback might throw the ball and the, and the cameraman can't keep up. And so all you can see is the quarterback throwing the ball as far as he can. When I know it was a little boy, it was our favorite thing to do is whenever the quarterback throw the ball, Noah would jump up and say, he sees something. He sees something. And we, me and Isaiah Noah, and me and Isaiah would jump up because we just knew something was about to happen. Can I tell y'all something? Jesus saw something. He saw beyond the pain. He saw beyond the shame. He saw beyond the trials and tribulations. He saw beyond the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Sadducees. He saw beyond all of that. And he saw that on the other side of the cross, he would be able to reconcile God back to man and man back to God. And so when he says this, it says this. It says, for the joy set before him. The joy set before Jesus wasn't the cross. It was what was on the other side of the cross. But guess what? Jesus kept on on his journey because he knew that when his work was done, he would have saved the world. He knew that when his work was done, lives would be changed. He knew when the work would be done, the people who are on their way to hell would be on their way to heaven. That's why Jesus did it. Now, let me pause parenthetically and come back to us. We as Christians have to see something. We have to look beyond the trials and tribulations, understanding that there is a promise for each of us. Sometimes we get caught up in this world and we look at the news and we read Facebook and we Instagram and we think this all it is. But I stopped by St. Peter today to tell somebody it ain't all right here. This ain't it. This is just a, a, the, 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 the runway for our eternal life. And so we have to see something. We have to know that God has promised us eternal life, that God has promised us that we will stand in the face in his presence and we are here well done. God has promised us that one day we'll see Jesus for ourselves and we'll look like him. We got to see something. We got to see beyond what the world says. We got to see beyond what our physical mind, eyes tell us and see into the spiritual realm. Let me say this right here. When we are running the race, we've got to understand that even in our, we talked about this last night in, in James 1, 
even in our trials and tribulations, we got to see something. We got to see that God is doing some work on us, that he's bringing patience out. We've got to see that even in the midst of what we go through, that because we serve God, he is doing something in us. We've got to see it, and we've got to keep on running with joy, knowing that what God has for us is better than what we have right now. Deacon Edward singing this song, I love it. I'm going to run on, and I'm not going to stop running because I'm going to see what the end going to be. But the songwriter, if I could just do a little amending on that song, I'm going to run on and, and see what the end going to be because he says there's something at the end is waiting on me. We know what it is. We know that there's joy with our sorrow. We know there's peace with our confusion on the other side. And even in this world, we get to experience the power in the presence of God. Let me tell one story. I'm about to, I'm about to walk out of here. When I was in eighth grade, uh, my best friend, Greg, you might remember him, little Fred Johnson. Now, Fred, by the time we got to be 12, I was about seven inches taller than him. And he was a little round fellow with short arms and short legs. I mean, he was normal, but he was just short. And I remember the first track meet of our eighth grade year, his school came and ran over there and walked with us. And, you know, he was the shortest, the smallest, the least athletic person on the team. He ran the mile because he wasn't fast enough to run the hundred. He ran the mile because he wasn't tall enough to do the hurdles. He ran the mile because he wasn't strong enough to throw the shot put in the distance. But he ran the mile because he wanted to be on that team. And so the mile was the last race of the meet. The hundred had been run, the 200, three, the 400, the hurdles, everything had been run. And they rolled out the mile. And so they shot the shot, begun to start the race. Fred was so slow that he fell behind, and the people who were running in front had lapped him. By the time Fred finished the race, they had packed up the hurdles and packed up everything else. He was still out there running. And he was my best friend. I stayed out there with him. Pretty soon, it was just me, him, and the coach who was going to cut the lights off in the stadium. But the funny thing is, the whole time Fred was running, he had a smile on his face. Even when folk would laugh in the first lap, even when folk had left for the second lap, even when all everybody but but me and him and the, and the guy with the lights was sent out there, the coaches were gone. It was just the custodian. He had a smile on his face. When he crossed that finish line, he looked at me, he ran in there, he hugged me, we hugged. And I was sitting there thinking to myself, boy, you were dead last. I said, you know, I'm, I'm proud of you. He said, man, I just wanted to finish this race. He said, I'm so excited. He said, because um, Vince, as we call him, Vince, you don't know. I've been trying to do this for a long time. I'm excited because I finished this race. I'm going to say this and I'm gone. God just wants us to focus on him. Fred was focused on finishing the race. God wants us to focus on what's on the other side. And it's going to keep us running. People may laugh at us, but just keep on running. People may leave you, but keep on running. Because you and me have to know that God has something for us. Let's focus on the joy of the completion of our race. And when you focus on the joy of the completion of your race, you will have joy on your journey. That's all I got to say. You will have joy for your journey. I love y'all and I thank God for you. And I'm about to go ahead and mess with the choir. But I just pray that we remember this, that Jesus is our example and he looked beyond. And we got to look beyond and know that there's something for us and let us have joy for our journey. Let me pray tonight. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we show enough praise you for all of your rich and manifold blessings. God, we thank you for the power, your grace, your mercy, your peace, your joy, your love. We thank you, Lord, that you've given us a Savior in Jesus. And we thank you, Lord, that not only is Jesus our Savior, but he's also the author and finisher of our faith. He is also our intermediary, our mediator. He also sits at your right hand, living to make intercession for us. And I pray, God, that on our journey, we on a journey, that you let us see something so that we can walk in joy. Take our journey in joy and live in victory in you. Let us rejoice in this fact that we may joy rejoice on this journey. God, I pray that you bless everybody on this phone line. Bless everybody on this Zoom line. And let us experience you in a way we've never experienced you before as a result of our joy. We love you. We thank you. And we praise you. It is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless your phone line. Hold on a little bit, Zoom line. God bless your phone line. Let me see. We got a good little crowd. Hey, Sister Lena Lewis, I ain't seen you on the phone. I'm glad you're back. <laughs> Sister Thomas, you, put a letter in Sister Lewis file for me. <laughs> it's good to see that Rev Stanley. God bless you. Bless Deacon, you. Deacon S. Edwards, God bless you. Uh, Deacon, Deacon S. Lyons, Sister Lewis, God bless you. Deacon, Deacon S. Thomas, Sister Roxanne, Sister Reese. I love y'all, and I'm going to see all y'all tomorrow night. God bless you. Good, good love word, you, Reverend too. God bless you.